Dave G's research focuses on the ethics and the democratic and democratic practices that emerge in an increasingly globalized and mass mediated world, with particular attention to the political thought of modern Islam. In his most recent book, The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, Militant Islam and, Glo and Global Politics, Dave G continues the nuanced examination of Islamic religious fundamentalism that distinguished his earlier work, Landscapes of the Jihad. Both works are fascinating investigations into the motives and modus operandi of contemporary political Islam, which, Dave G argues, must be understood as an increasingly globalized phenomenon. Dr. Paul Apostolides has completed his PhD from, the, from Cornell University in 1996 and is currently associate professor and judge and Mrs. Timothy A. Paul Chair of Political Science at Whitman College. His research synthesizes critical media studies with an acute awareness of contemporary politics and social theory. Dr. Apostolides is currently working on a book that examines the narratives of immigrant workers in the context of critical theories of power, particularly those of Foucault and Gramsci. He is also concluding a study of the political attitudes, amongst, uh, political attitudes among and occupational dangers faced by Latin American workers. His first book, Stations of the Cross, Adorno and the Christian Right, right and Christian Right Radio, published by Duke University Press in 2000, addresses the question of the flourishing of Christian popular culture in American society in the latter half of the 20th century. In the course of his study, which focuses particularly on the popular radio program, Focus on the Family, Apostolides develops the critical theory of Theodore Adorno to explore evangelicalism in the context of modern mass media. I have also been told that he has a forthcoming book in 2000 that will be that that that, that develops the, the work that I just mentioned, known that the title of which is Breaks in the Chain, Immigrant Workers' Stories of Power in Late Modern America. Uh, our two speakers will both uh, speak for about 15 minutes each, and then afterwards respond uh, one to the other, and then after that we will open up uh, for questions from the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Spencer, and thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here, as always, uh, to return to Chicago. Um, I'll just go right into my text and uh, try to finish it in the time allotted. Uh, though in hiding somewhere between Pakistan and Afghanistan, one of Al-Qaeda's chief spokesmen was able to answer a series of questions from friends and foes around the world in April 2008. Submitted to Ayman al-Zawahiri through the internet and res responded to in the same fashion, these queries included many expostulating with Osama bin Laden's lieutenant about the indiscriminate violence resorted to by those fighting in the name of Islam. Typical was this condemnation of militant methods. How do you reconcile the values of your medical training to help people and prolong their lives with the fact that you killed Anwar al-Sadat and that you shaped the minds of suicide bombers, uh, of bombers and suicide commandos? Zawahiri responded to his questioner in the following way. During my medical studies, I learned that life is Allah's miracle and his gift. Thus, one must be careful to obey him. I have learned from surgery about how to save, serve the body, sorry, to save the body by amputating failing organs and removing cancers, and how to cure illness-inducing bacteria. Medicine, when practiced as a sacrifice to Allah and to help the oppressed, will grant the soul happiness and joy, which will never be experienced by those who have twisted it into a tool for greed, robbing others and exploiting their pain for their own benefit. This justification of violence illustrates the crucial role the language of humanity plays in the narrative of militancy. Rather than being dedicated solely to the cause of Islam, in other words, militancy stakes claim to mankind itself as an ideal. Thus, Zawahiri describes terrorism as a form of surgery, whose aim is to save the human race from the cancers and other ailments that threaten its global body. Identified with medicine practiced according to the Hippocratic Oath, this vision of militancy as a form of sacrifice for the sake of mankind is opposed to humanitarianism in its conventional and com commercially organized forms, which Zawahiri argues are founded upon exploitation and profit. By representing the species as an individual, or rather by making the two interchangeable, Zawahiri 
uh, treats it as a potential subject, one that requires the healing touch of jihad to speak in its own name. Militant Islam's attempt to represent humanity as an historical actor comes to the fore in Ayman al-Zawahiri's response to another question put to him over the internet. Uh, can you clear up the confusion that many Westerners have about technology? On the one hand, you shun modern values, but on the other hand, you accept modern Western technology, such as the internet. Hastening to brush aside any account of terrorism that would confine it to some contradiction between Muslim tradition and Western modernity, Zawahiri makes it clear that even the greatest enemies must share a common history and partake of each other's achievements as members of the same species. In other words, he moves beyond the narratives of race or civilization, from which the distinction of traditional and modern is often derived, to focus on the human race as history's true subject. And he says in response, this question is based on two false premises. The fact that I accept or shun a certain value is not based on whether it is ancient or modern. But I am opposed to polytheism, scorning the religion, establishing relations based on material benefit and achieving sensory pleasure, lying, deceiving, acting on self-interest, alcoholism, gambling, vices, taking over other people's territories uh, and oppressing them, stealing the riches of others, double standards, immunity against being held accountable for crimes for which others will be punished, spreading killing, abuse, destruction, and the destruction of the environment and climate merely to master the land, rob and plunder. In this whole list, of course, there is no, nothing particular to Islam theologically. Uh, scientific knowledge, he continues, is neither Eastern nor Western. It is the property of mankind which circulates among us equally in various times and places. The scientific progress of the West was originally based on our riches, which they are still plundering to this day. Where is our stolen share? Secondly, the West tried to cover up its crimes against us and against the rest of mankind by priding itself in its scientific supremacy. Under the cover of this progress, they have attempted um, to convince occupied and weaker nations that they, the West, are superior to them and more deserving to manage the world and to plunder its riches and to demean other people. Neither Muslims nor anyone else will be, uh, will be fooled by this trick any longer. Arguably the operative category of militant thinking, humanity brings Muslims and infidels together in such a way as to make possible relations of amity as well as enmity among them. I will be concerned here with the ambivalence that marks this relationship of would-be friends and foes, a quality evident in the passage from Zawahiri cited above. For at the same moment that he claims the achievements of his enemies as properly human inheritance, Bin Laden's more, most eminent follower also suggests that some of the credit for amassing this legacy was stolen from Muslims and needs recovery. Now this kind of reasoning possesses a history going back to the 19th century, when Muslim reformers sought by such apologetics to explain as well as learn from the scientific and technological dominance of Europe's colonial powers. This they did by devaluing the categories of race and civilization as sites of European privilege and bringing humanity up to the fore as history's true subject. Islam therefore represented the species by refusing to differentiate between its various components. Perhaps the first and certainly the most influential Muslim thinker to forge such a link between Perhaps the first and certainly the most influential Muslim thinker to forge such a link between Islam and humanity was India's Sayyid Ahmad Khan, whose life was dedicated to modernizing his co-religionists largely by way of inculcating Western education among them. In a monumental effort of scriptural interpretation and exegesis, Khan contended that Islam, when cleansed of superstitious accretions, was both the most natural and the most universal of religions. This in the sense of being wholly in conformity with the laws of nature and so founded for the benefit of all mankind. Whether the precedence, uh, whatever the precedence and implications of this claim, extrapolated from writers like Gibbon and Carlyle as much as from any Muslim source, it is clear that Islam's universality was predicated upon its equivalence with 19th century notions of nature and therefore with the human species.
both of which stood outside the doctrinal sphere of religion to provide the criterion of its veracity. Islam's conformity with nature conceived as law had to be repeatedly demonstrated so that it might be presented as the universal religion of mankind. One consequence of naturalizing religion in this way was to generalize its doctrinal vocabulary beyond the boundaries of Islam, so that it now became possible to think even of its central concepts as being universal to humanity. Of course, Muslim thinkers in the past had sought precedents and prognostications for Muhammad's revelation by linking it to religions predating Islam well beyond the monotheistic coterie, this latter form with Judaism and Christianity. While the Muslim doctrines discovered in Hinduism, Buddhism, or Zoroastrianism might place all these religions within some universal history, there was no question about Islam representing its pinnacle. But the Victorian naturalization of religion meant that if Muslims could be said to have discovered the unity of mankind uh, by way of Islam, or even to have developed this unity to its full potential, they could not claim to possess it exclusively or indeed forever. There was always the possibility that others might be able to lay claim to Islam itself, albeit under a different name, if Muslims were to abandon their duty to represent the human race. In fact, there were many instances from the last decades of the 19th century of prominent Muslim figures in India warning that unbelievers had come into possession of Islam's central concepts and categories. A good example of this is provided by the century's uh, most popular Urdu text, an epic poem on the rise and fall of Islam by Sayyid Ahmad Khan's disciple, Altaf Hussein Hali. First published in 1879, the Musaddas Dharmadu Jazar Islam sings of the virtues that brought Muslims political prowess, uh, political power in times past and put them at the forefront of the arts and sciences. Hali then categorizes, uh, then catalogues the decline of India's Muslims in particular and those of the world at large in practically every department of social life, attributing their decadence to the betrayal of Islamic virtues. Chief among these was fidelity to nature, seen as providing both the form and the content of human knowledge as a set of universal laws. While Muslims might have forsaken such virtues, others, like Europe's Christians, but also the poet's Hindu neighbors, are said to have embraced them and thus moved past the Prophet's followers in representing humanity. In order to make the argument that Islam's role has been taken over by the Christian West, Hali had to redefine the Muslim Ummah or community in sociological terms. No longer a juridical or theological category defined by ritual authority and political practice, the Ummah instead became a society that could never again be contained within legal norms, and one whose global character placed Islam outside the jurisdiction of any state. While the loss of political power, therefore, was seen in the poem as a sign of decline, its restoration did not serve as a condition for Muslim greatness, which was why Hali could take colonized populations like the Hindus as models of virtue. Important about the new Muslim community is its elegiac character. And while this mournful vision of the Ummah is often considered the consequence of colonial dispossession, I would like to argue for a more complex reading of the trope. For the narrative of Muslim decline pioneered by Hali is related to another common in Europe at the same time, though with a prehistory going back to medieval times. This is the story of European decadence conceived not in political or juridical terms, exemplified by the fall of kingdoms and dynasties, but in the vision of exhausted civilizations and depleted races. Like the Ummah, in other words, race and civilization are categories that may incorporate state power, but continue to embody a people's greatness beyond its confines. As a consequence, they have since the 18th century also been global categories, whose context is provided by other civilizations and races spread across the surface of the earth. Like some of the narratives dealing with the de decadence of races or civilizations, the story of Islam's decline was predicated upon, its in upon the inability of its adherents to keep pace with their own universality. In making this case, of course, Hali was invoking an old literary model in which the fall of kingdoms was attributed to the moral corruption of their rulers, itself a consequence of worldly success. More than the ancient kingdoms that had in the past, oh, one minute, but I have to end. Um, I was going to uh, uh, move on from Hali to another figure, Muhammad Iqbal, um, and I'll just summarize here by saying that one of the things that Iqbal does uh, is to uh, move the location of Islam's universality from nature uh, to history. Right? So Iqbal will say, for instance, that um, uh, the coming of the Prophet Muhammad uh, was a sign of the coming into being of the human race itself. 
as a potentially historical subject because Muhammad uh, uh, announced uh, that his own mission was the last mission. Uh, he was the last prophet of God. In doing so, Iqbal suggested uh, 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 Muhammad threw back divine responsibility to the Muslim community itself or to mankind itself. So mankind cut off from divine revelation, from direct, direct divine guidance, becomes uh, a, a subject in its own right, at least potentially, uh, becomes a mature subject. You can see how this is linked to various um, uh, descriptions of enlightenment, etc., etc., in Europe, right? Uh, and even how uh, Muhammad plays a kind of role that might be attributed to Jesus, to Christ, in, in other such scenarios. Jesus as being both man and God. Right? Um, uh, so I think maybe I'll stop here. There is more to say about it, but I have uh, no, you have exhausted my time. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess we'll get to the part about the terrorists later. <laughs> um, over the last year or so, a spate of media reports have emerged, declaring that a new era has dawned in the politics of the Christian right in the United States. A typical example of this was an article that appeared last summer in the New Yorker magazine. The new evangelicals, the reporter wrote, had, quote, set a new national policy agenda one founded on their understanding of the life of Jesus and his ministry to the poor, the outcast, and the peacemakers. And the article cited Orange County megachurch pastor and best-selling author Rick Warren as one of the, quote, new breed of preachers who are opposed to dethrone an aging generation of Christian right lions. It's true that Warren exhorts evangelicals to take action to address world poverty, disease, and environmental damage. He is thus widely interpreted to be leading a sea change in evangelical conservatism, away from the long dominant model of a politics based in family values and aimed mainly at matters of sexual morality and public expressions of religiosity. But Warren's influence now extends far beyond evangelical circles. One testament to that came in August 2008 when the two major presidential candidates One testament to that came in August 2008, when the two major presidential candidate, candidates made pilgrimages to Warren's Saddleback megachurch in California to hold a nationally televised civil forum. And then this past January came the real shocker, when Barack Obama invited Warren to give the benediction at the inauguration. Now, many on the left criticized Obama's decision by arguing that Warren's politics aren't really so different from those of James Dobson or Pat Robertson. And after all, he had come out publicly against gay marriage in the California 2008 initiative campaign. And just a few years earlier, uh, Warren had sent out a public announcement urging millions of evangelicals uh, to remember certain quote-unquote non-negotiable items like abortion and homosexuality as they cast their votes for president in 2004. Well, in some current research, I've been examining Warren's sermons and reflecting on the political dispositions that animate many of them. And I would argue that there is something genuinely new about the political ethos that Warren is promoting, something that distinguishes him from older leaders like Dobson. But what is most novel about Warren is not any meaningful shift to the left on social policy or world affairs. Rather, it, it is his unprecedented effacement of the political in the very context of his call to remake God's earth as a place free of need and suffering. Now, to help set the stage for our discussion, first I'd like to offer a few critical readings of passages from his sermons on global disasters. And then I'll briefly discuss Warren's vision of spreading the church worldwide through an ever-expanding network of what he calls small groups. These cells of believers are supposed to carry out the mission that Warren has packaged as his global peace plan. That's an acronym that stands for promoting reconciliation, equipping leaders, assisting the poor, caring for the sick, and educating the next generation. I'll argue that Warren's discourse of Christian social action partly carries forward a long-standing element of Christian right culture, and that is the activation and direction of a complex and internally warring set of affects within the individual, and also setting these currents of feeling in motion among both interpersonal and globally ranging communities of prayerful believers. 
This struggle of faith, which makes regulating one's feelings the primary response to world social catastrophes, paradoxically imbues Warren's socially engaged Christianity with a profound cynicism about public engagement of any sort. For the pioneers of Warren's peace plan, both the social democratic projects of Christian progressives and the private voluntarist organizational activities of what was until recently known as the New Christian Right are now beside the point. This abandonment of collective organization for political struggle, I then suggest, helps define the anti-politics of the new evangelicalism as distinctly neoliberal. But there's also a more complicated connection to neoliberalism implied in Warren's discourse about a network of small groups in which everyone and no one is a leader, where individuals express themselves with the keenest emotional intensity and authenticity, and where they create a holistic world community through a synthesis of the spiritual, the natural, the technological, and the transfigurative power of markets. Warren's plan for peace, I argue, popularizes for evangelical masses as never before the current ideology of digital utopianism that helps secure hegemony for the neoliberal turn. Adapting and amplifying the themes of self-organizing systems, do-it-yourself localism, and a wired global community that have traveled a trippy and serpentine path from the 60s counterculture to the new right, Warren assists leaders like Obama, who currently face a governing crisis of the highest order, brought on by the worldwide economic meltdown. By transporting believers towards a post-political horizon where the whole world changes for the good, Warren helped prevent the formation of organized popular constituencies with which state officials otherwise would have to contend as they seek to restabilize the conditions of capital accumulation. That's the argument in brief. Now to talk quickly about uh, one of the sermons. So I look uh, in this paper I'm writing at a, a number of different ser sermons that he gives on global disasters. And one is on Hurricane Katrina, right after the Katrina hits New Orleans. And um, his signature message that being a Christian means helping others, which is a refrain that you hear again and again in his sermons, comes through loud and clear in his sermon. But when he talks about rebuilding after a disaster, um, the accent for Warren is on the stability of the psyche rather than the physical features of urban neighborhoods, identifying with the emotional trauma of flood victims, in particular their struggles to let go of the things they have lost and trust in God's providence, takes the place of analyzing the human factors contributing to so-called natural disasters and addressing them politically. Um, and, uh, Warren gives us examples, models of people who happen to be his in-laws, who lost everything that they had in a flood in 1986 in Marysville, California, um, but neither they nor Warren acknowledge the differences between the flooding of a western mining town of 12,000 people and the flooding of a major city like New Orleans. And no one talks about the differences between uh, a white middle class couple grieving over their lost love letters from college and how this might not adequately convey the kinds of losses suffered by African Americans en masse in New Orleans. Instead, the story functions as a way of suppressing any interest in, in investigating social or political precipitants of these events. Such critical considerations, Warren admonishes, are nothing but the fruits of bitterness and resentment that come from, quote, holding on to the hurt rather than letting one's feelings go. And this expression of your emotions is what God wants, because as Warren says, quote, God has emotions, God laughs, God gets angry, God grieves. That's why you do too, because you were made in his image. Thus, for Warren, the actively emoting believer mirrors back the countenance of a deity who is defined crucially by his capacity to feel and to empathize. And then what you're supposed to do in the face of disasters is not just feel your own feelings to the full extent, but also get your feelings moving through networks of affect that connect you to other people, both close to home and at vast distances. So for instance, when Warren preaches about, quote, what to do during a war, right after the US invades Iraq in 2003, he has his mega parish of 23,000 people break down into small huddles and pray. And the idea is for them to try to feel there how frightening it is to have a loved one wearing an American uniform on the battlefield, or what it feels like to be among the, quote, weak and helpless multitudes in Iraq as the bombs fall around them. So it is prayer, powered by contact with the God who emotes, that generates this affective link with strangers both here and abroad. And yet the believer's trial of faith remains squarely located within the self and requires managing the self's warring impulses to fear the imputed enemy and to identify with him in a posture of abject terror and paralysis. And Warren provokes both of these impulses, setting up this economy of feeling. 
Um, now, Warren, in doing this, carries forward some key characteristics of old evangelicalism. I don't have time to talk about it right now, but we can talk about how Dobson does pretty much the same thing with respect to gays and lesbians, setting up a kind of harsh antipathy on one side, but calling for compassion on the other side. But Dobson also pulls that believer back into the arena of political cultural struggle in ways that no longer seem to interest Warren. Focus on the family urges listeners to get active in organized collective efforts to change society, doing state-level policy advocacy, for example, with the Family Research Council. For Warren, by contrast, this sort of collective action and institution building is, being, uh, is exactly what has given evangelicals a bum rap, making Christians known, as he says, quote, for what they're against rather than what they're for. Instead, Warren wants his flock to plumb the depths of their feelings and then project passion outward through the bonds of affection that are unburdened by the drudgery of going to meetings, monitoring legislation, or arguing with anyone. But now what about Warren's global peace plan? Warren counts this as a bold new initiative to conquer social problems across the face of the earth. And he says that thousands of volunteers have... Now what about Warren's global peace plan? Warren counts this as a bold new initiative to conquer social problems across the face of the earth. And he says that thousands of volunteers have already gone overseas to do this. And he gives his small groups the mission of helping others all over the world. Um, they're supposed to do this first by converting people to Christianity, using videos and evangelical resources from the Saddleback Ministry. And then they give seminars on abstinence to prevent HIV infection, distribute a basic literacy curriculum, and then assess local economic opportunities for developing micro-enterprises. Media reports confirm my suspicions that these efforts, which mainly have been concentrated in Rwanda, have not been especially effective at addressing poverty and underdevelopment. However, by the end of last year, Peace Volunteers had chalked up 10,000 baptisms, founded 500 churches, and commissioned 200 new pastors. It seems fair to say that at least at this point, then, Warren's peace plan is so far is mostly about the ceaseless self-reproduction of Christian mini-churches, that's what he calls the small groups, around the world, conceived as an ever-growing network of these small groups. And this means that the peace initiative reinforces rather than mitigates Warren's rejection of the need for organized public activity. And that's because, as Warren tells us over and over again, um, paradoxically, the small groups, because they operate on a micro level, are supposed to be able to solve problems that are too gigantic for either government agencies to solve or for charitable, voluntary groups to handle. So again, we see what's most new about the new evangelicalism, a break not just with the social democratic and social movement-based approach to solving mass problems of public welfare, but also now with the new rights and the old evangelicals' countervision of a mobilized array of voluntary parachurch organizations. Now this turn away from all forms of political engagement is of course strategically useful to Obama and other world leaders as they try to repair the damage done by the recent economic collapse without fundamentally altering the structure of neoliberal capitalism, all the fear monitoring about socialism and the White House notwithstanding. On the one hand, state officials must find a technical administrative fix to the current capitalist crisis and legitimate it politically. On the other hand, they face the threat of escalating popular discontent as new crises emerge, since right now there is no political coalition of the left powerful enough to support any genuine democratization of the control over capital. The new evangelicalism helps reduce the severity of this dilemma by diminishing the political costs of failing to pursue such far-reaching reforms. Yet, Warren's new evangelicalism also does something more ambitious ideologically than simply promote a depoliticized, market-oriented, neoliberal rationality. Uh, and I, that's what I want to discuss in concluding. Um, I would argue that instead of viewing the discourse in this reductionist way, we ought to search for its politics in the abundant tensions that permeate it, the ambivalences of the discourse. I would argue rather that instead of viewing the discourse, oh wait, I just said that. Uh, <laughs> like the hope, um, for example, of lacing the world together 
um, by multiplying exponentially this fabric of tiny little small groups, or of recouping for evangelicalism and enthusiasm about social progress while ridiculing collective vehicles of action, or as I shall discuss momentarily, making leadership for change at once ubiquitous and impossible either to think or perform. These moments of friction in Warren's sermons bear a striking resemblance to another current ideology in our time, the one that cultural historian Fred Turner calls digital utopianism. Turner has written a fascinating genealogy of this discourse, which today appears in Wired magazine and in the statements of conservative pundits like Newt Gingrich and George Gilder. He traces its antecedents back to the 60s counterculture, especially the new communalist subculture that sprang up around the whole earth catalog. By using the catalog and later the whole earth digital networks, Turner writes, quote, a geographically dispersed collection of individuals and groups could recognize each other as members of a single community and they could act as a single community, a global community, and do this in a way that was thoroughly egalitarian because there was no hierarchy or centralized authority operating the system. The key concept here was the notion of a self-organizing system, a whole system that was entirely natural, social, technological, and spiritual at the same time, and it ran itself. When the new communalism of the 60s went digital in the 80s, Turner shows a distinctly new element of the discourse emerged. Now it aggressively celebrated free market values in its vision of an endlessly creative, quote, self-regulating biotechnological system that was divested of all authority and that generated both total individual fulfillment and mystical community. These digital utopian desires profoundly animate Warren's global peace plan. First, there's the way that Warren intermeshes organic and technophilic language. So the small groups are supposed to plant churches all over the world. At the same time, Warren can't stop talking about email, which is how revelations about the tsunami in Asia, for example, uh, penetrate mundane life in Orange County. Then there's the way that by joining the network, believers experience the ecstasy of unhindered individual feeling and expression, spiritual secrets of an earlier era, found by moving back to the land, and then later by immersing themselves in the digitalized cosmos. There's also a shared spatial organizational logic, the idea of a planetary network of locally rooted small groups, such that the technology of the system not only links them, but enables them to act as one, to act as the system itself. And this means a perfect simultaneity of localism and globalism, which Warren's template, that's what he calls it, for spreading the purpose-driven church enables. In the do-it-yourself spirit of the communes and the web, everyone is doing their own thing in their own way, yet also acting in seamless accord, and there is, quote, no one left behind. Finally, and most importantly, Warren makes the classically digital utopian move of making all hier hierarchical institutionalized power seem to evaporate, thus making specific discourses of power and those in positions of authority inaccessible to critique. In Warren's vision of the church, quote, every person is a leader, the church becomes a self-governing system where sovereign authority is both perfectly dispersed and wholly unified, where supreme power rests either in the most elemental parts or in the totality, but never in more ambiguous intermediary territory. So to conclude then, what role does the new evangelicalism play in neoliberal times if it is neither a rekindled social gospel movement nor just James Dobson Redux? Well, first it offers the exhilaration of joining a worldwide revolution, that's Warren's term, while remaining contemptuous of political activism, or indeed any sort of public action. It generates complicated neoliberal subjects who integrate their desires for generosity and community into their profit-seeking activities, rather than merely letting the latter eclipse the former. It also helps preempt the formation of popular organizations that might impede state officials' formidable task of rescuing neoliberalism from itself. And finally, the new evangelical Christianity mobilizes believers to engage personally with others in the world, but gives them no specifically political capacities with which to do so. Instead, Warren commissions them to initiate circuits of exchange, emotional intercourse, where the common currency is terror of death and the need of God, and economic trade, transfiguring all the world into a global network of markets, one small group at a time. Thanks. I should say that, that uh, I think this panel, more than even the, the, the previous, uh, has, has accepted the kind of the, the risk of this format uh, more than, uh, than, than, many, than, than many would be prepared to do, because now they're, 
now we're going to try to stage a discussion between these two <laughs> very different, uh, very different uh, sort of domains of scholarship. Uh, whereas before we sort of had Obama as a unifying theme, and the, the, what unifies these papers is, is something much more abstract and, 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 and hopefully uh, can emerge uh, in a discussion. Uh, so, uh, if you want to begin, sure. Um, I was just thinking. Uh, Sure. Um, I was just thinking, um, these, uh, the sort of internationalist aspect of um, the Warren Ministry, mm -hmm. going abroad, mm -hmm. uh, being with victims of various sorts, and identifying themselves. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the people with whom I begin, the, who go under the name Al-Qaeda and maybe other militant forms, mm -hmm. um, start off with the same kind of rhetoric. And, and they too, when they, but when they go to these places to serve these victims, they don't, as it was, serve them in any humanitarian sense. They fight. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there seems to be no kind of um, recognition that, that the presence of militants in these as well host communities might lead to um, more uh, death and destruction on their part. But that, what, what I found interesting is that though there's that similarity, What's very different is that uh, militants never seem to identify as fully with their victims. That is, with the victims whom they go mm -hmm. um, to help, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. as, as the people you're talking about. So that in, in the in militant discourse, militant discourse is, is still structured by the language of pity as a kind of distant thing. Mm -hmm. It's much more humanitarian in that sense. Mm -hmm. There's no attempt to say um, those people are like, we too are suffering, like they are suffering. We are like them. We share this thing in common. Uh, when the militant becomes a martyr, yes, then there is this language. But again, it's not necessarily, uh, to my mind, linked so directly uh, to empathy. To empathy in the way that it creates this community, uh, this narcissistic community that uh, that you are talking about. And that struck me as being, as being quite interesting. But they seem to be operating more with classical notion. Very much so. And then, when you say that militants go um, to be with the victims, is it, are the victims already fighting? Uh, well, not necessarily. Know, military conflicts, or and they're fighting, and, and then the militants come fight alongside them. Or? They could be, but not necessarily. It's not necessarily the case. So, in some situations, whether it's in Bosnia or later on in Afghanistan, there is the kind of rhetoric of joining a struggle that's already in progress, yeah. right, of, you know, participating in it and helping it. And also, therefore, placing, let us say, foreign fighters, placing themselves under the leadership of a local uh, notable or a local leader. Interesting. Um, uh, so there is that. That's certainly a difference. Although there, 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 are, there are also great tensions there. Uh, because very often, the victims don't measure up to the ideal of yeah. uh, what a true Muslim should be. Uh, the leaders are not appropriate leaders. They're not religiously appropriate. Uh, and yet, the, uh, the task before the militants is not therefore to convert them uh, to what they think of as an appropriate form of Islam. Right. Though in Bosnia, apparently, there was some attempt. Uh, there is criticism, but there doesn't seem to be a kind of evangelizing uh, motive. That I also find interesting. I mean, they're already Muslims, right? They're, they're, they're already Muslims, Muslims, but they're not. Uh, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the evangelical scenario, I suppose, be a question of you know, have they been born again or do they need to be evangelized right and here right. while there is criticism of their in, improper Muslimness mm -hmm. there seems to be little if any attempt to bring them over to the to the side of truth right. as far as religious practice and doctrine is concerned very interesting. Um, so what it all means then is is there also I mean Warren is very clear that there is this uh, template I mean, he's he's just very frank about the idea that that his his volunteers abroad have the recipe for how to how to formulate the just community over there, and you just have to superimpose it on whatever situation that is. 
He talks in the abstract about how the peace plan volunteers are supposed to be going to 47 different countries. And it doesn't seem to matter that he doesn't name them you know, or distinguish, well, why are you going to Nigeria and why are you going to Indonesia or wherever? I mean, you don't know where they are other than Rwanda, which is the main one that, that the media have, have, have focused on. Um, it, in terms of tactics, though, military or, or social welfare or otherwise, is there a similar sense that there's a template that the militant groups have or more of a uh, versatility depending on the situation on the ground? Well, there is, I mean, as we know now from the media, there are all these so-called handbooks, right? These yeah. Handbooks, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but they're they very different kinds of documents. Like you don't, they're not uniform in themselves. What you do have is a, they do name countries, right? So there's a list, invariably there's a list mm -hmm. of places in which Muslims are victimized, right? And it's in which they sort of parachute themselves into, much like humanitarian aid, et cetera, uh, outfits, uh, mm -hmm. who serve, I think, as their models in many ways. Um, but, and, and as you suggest with the Warren group, there too you have this ideal of um, the state has failed or it's too much, you know, it's just not, it shouldn't be doing this stuff. Uh, there too you have a, a kind of, as it were, decentered, networked notion mm -hmm. of what services and what interrelationships are you know, across that kind of global arena. But where the difficulty arises is that whereas you tie it in a certain way to neoliberalism, here it might, it might well be part of the same logic, but I'm not sure what the um, what the um, effective ties would be, what the links would be. Mm -hmm. right? in, in a situation like Afghanistan, you know, to talk about um, militancy and um, in a, within a kind of neoliberal uh, framework in a place where um, the state that even neoliberalism presupposes doesn't exist, etc., etc. So how it works is anyone's guess, but it does work globally in such ways as, um, and, the, and the, these ways need to be militant. If you think about something like um, global protests over, you know, these Danish cartoons or whatever, again you have this, it's exactly how you describe, um, uh, much more spectacularly done, right? right. You, know, you have this kind of viral thing, there's no leadership, there's no, no political parties are necessarily involved, there are all kinds of things that all come together, they recognize each other, or recognize themselves as a group on television, mm -hmm. and in the media, and, and all the rest, and yet uh, these kinds of spectacular uh, forms of globalized network uh, making do not seem to have in the uh, literature been uh, linked to neoliberalism as a project or even an attitude. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how I would do it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's impossible to miss in the evangelical discourse of someone like Warren. I mean, there are the uh, <laughs> You know, he talks about not only are the, the peace plan volunteers supposed to go into these 47 countries and give suggestions for how people can, quote, start to sell things to escape poverty uh, by founding new microenterprises, but he, I mean, the, the rhetoric is just um, suffused with terms out of a kind of neoliberal political rationality. Thinking about Wendy Brown's argument here and the cultivation of the neoliberal subject, uh, the, uh, you know, he talks, for example, when, when conversion happens, the first thing that you need to do is provide, quote unquote, just in time theological training. It borrows from the current, actually, as improbable as that might be, uh, you know, he borrows uh, again and again from a kind of common sense uh, market capitalist vocabulary. Uh, so, but it's also true that in, in, in an interesting way that, you know, these disciples, these missionaries are just as detached from whatever the specific project of neoliberalism is, wherever they happen to be visiting, um, as perhaps um, Islamic militants might be, because they just carry the template with them and have an idea that is kind of based, I don't know, I guess in Orange County, about what, you know, what a free society looks like. The other thing that I would say is that they, um, it, the, the discourse slides from talking about freedom and choice and markets very quickly into military vocabulary as well. So Warren refers to the peace plan volunteers as his uh, saddleback green berets or his um, 
you know, peace missionaries, uh, the, uh, I think he uses other sort of soldier uh, type terms. Sacrifice, which is um, where I was going to end in this uh, mm -hmm. in this piece. We should talk about that. I was going to suggest, but you read the longer version. Right, right. Um, that um, uh, uh, whereas in the initial instance, um, uh, Islam is made universal by or has to demonstrate, and that's the, the anxiety of constantly having to demonstrate that you represent that Islam represents humanity over and over again, precisely because the criterion is no longer within a kind of theological language of Islam. It's now outside it's the laws of nature. Right? You have to measure up to them constantly. You have to prove that Islam, the Quran, etc. are more attuned, are more in conformity with those things than anyone else is. Uh, you move from nature as providing a criterion to as also just in history, in particular the figure of the Prophet, seen in a kind of almost Christological way. You know, as this kind of interesting shift between the divine world and the mortal world, the way that God and man come together, except in the case of the prophet, he's the last one. After that, you no, you no longer have access to divine revelation. So humanity comes into existence in this negative sense as a sub potential subject. But where I wanted to end up is saying, when you move to his, from nature to history, you already move to the past. Right? The past now serves as a criterion, the founding moment of Islamic universality. That's where humanity has become manifest. In, in more recent iterations of the logic among fundamentalist thinkers and then it, among the militants whom I began with, what you have is very curious that now humanity must be represented through sacrifice. So that again the Christological motive is there, but to the, the sacrifice of your own interests um, in, in, mart in, in martyrdom and other such forms of sacrifice. It's only in this way that you can represent the human race, that you can prove that you are better able to um, do so than anyone else. And yet the logic of it is still one of, um, in the way you suggest very differently in your paper, of um, you know how you recognize the HIV uh, uh, person or the whoever, right, as yourself. Uh -huh. uh, here they don't identify completely, but it's a question of we must recover who we are from the other whether this other is a friend or an enemy, right? Um, but you can only do so in a competitive sense by saying, in fact, we must recover ourselves so that we represent the human race. Uh, we are better able to do so. We have recovered our human right. Right. But only through the other. Uh, and, and this can be done in completely divergent ways. So on the one hand, you have this, um, uh, if you take, for instance, the figure of the Hindu as representing humanity, right, better than the Muslim. In, in uh, Gandhi's days, for instance, you have many kinds of examples of this where people said, Muslim thinkers, eminent Muslim thinkers said, Gandhi actually is more Muslim than we are. Right? Um, we need to recover Islam from Gandhi, we need to become more Gandhi than Gandhi. Right? Because the of other, politics, which I Yes, yeah, that and other things. Right? So they say Gandhi uh, represents the quality of sub uh, endurance. Right? Uh, on the other hand, you have this sort of um, Muslim forms of fascism. By, by someone like Alam al-Mashriqi, who will say, Hitler um, is more Muslim than Muslims are. You know, we need to be more like the Germans, the Nazis, to actually... So it's a, it's a, it's a same language, but it's yeah. completely split yeah. uh, politically. Right? And, and that's what I find very interesting. Do you think it's possible to say, because there, there seems to be a kind of similar ambiguity yeah. in the language that you are looking at. And you do suggest so there's wired like in the, in the sort of 60s mm -hmm. uh, radicalism on the one hand and the whole earth. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I was, I've been thinking, since I read your paper, I've been thinking a lot about this issue of humanity emerging as a subject or an agent in its own right. And is that, is that what uh, Warren is trying to invoke when he talks about this global peace plan? And, it, and, and it's both yes and no. On, on, on the one hand, there's a way that 
Um, you know, yeah, I mean, this network of believers acting all over the world is supposed to ultimately realize humanity is supposed to encompass all of humanity, especially given the evangelistic thrust of it all. Everyone's supposed to be brought within the network, and then it will reach its fulfillment, and we will have that. Um, but at, at the same time, it's just remarkable that the discourse of um, sacrifice, which you would think would be in there when you're talking about a program to send volunteers overseas to places they've never been, to very impoverished you know, areas, um, that Warren hardly talks about sacrifice at all. In his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, it comes up once in the first couple of chapters and then just gets kind of abandoned. But he's not, I mean, really, Warren is telling people that you need to help others, and in doing that, you will find a fulfilling and satisfying life in all of the conventional ways. So you'll have less stress in your life because you'll be more focused, and you will have more satisfying relationships with other people and therefore you'll be more at peace with yourself and with those who are, who are around you. And you'll, you'll enjoy material prosperity. Even when it comes to money, he's not saying that you know, you're going to have to give and have less for yourself. He's saying that it's really all about how you manage your money. You have to be a good trustee, is the word he uses, of the resources that God has loaned you. God being conceived here not just as one who loves, but who also invests and manages private property, which everything belongs to God, he's like the ultimate proprietarian. So, um, so, so to, in that sense, it's almost as though Warren and these evangelicals kind of give Al-Qaeda what they want. They are a sort of figure of decadence, you know, capitulation of faith and sacrifice to, uh, you know, a kind of frank capitalism. So, so there, 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 there's a way, I mean, there, there are ways both that, that these two different groups seem to double each other, and ways that they're foils. Um, One of the uh, uh, things, you know, after I read your paper, that interested me is um, uh, among many of these characters who I'm writing about, mm -hmm. the role that Christianity plays. Right? On the one hand, it's a kind of, uh, it's a model of theft, right? They've stolen from us, and so we need what I've said. Uh -huh. On the other hand, and of course that is all about, you know, why are they better than we are? Why are they better off than we are? You know, what, what have they done that we haven't done? Why are they stolen from us? But on the other hand, there's this critique, which is Christianity is too successful. The Christians have achieved worldly success, and in achieving worldly success, they have lost their souls. Right? Um, and therefore, what you have is the perversion of Europe. They're talking about Europe mostly. Right? European civilization into a materialistic, imperialist, etc., etc., form, and that they need to recover Christianity themselves. So there's this whole internal logic of not that they should accept Islam, but they need to recover Jesus. Themselves they need to recover Jesus, right. because they've lost it. Right. Uh, so in that sense, there's also the, the staking of a Christian, the staking Christian claim yes. among these Muslim thinkers, especially the 19th and 20th century ones. You know, of, um, uh, so on the one hand, you know, Muhammad is seen in kind of Christ-like ways in some senses, and on the other, there's a kind of sub-discourse which is entirely Christian, mm -hmm. in which the Muslim doesn't even intrude. The Muslim theological categories don't necessarily intrude. Right. So they don't want to become Christian. It's like, you should be Christian. Right. Like, why aren't you as Christian as you should be? Uh, this is why your, your civilization has become violent. Right. That, that sort of, um, you know, that, that particular generosity. Sort of, um, you know, that that particular generosity of spirit is not there. Being generous, uh, but you know, I mean, that's that's actually a really interesting component of the Christian right discourse that has changed since I wrote the book nine nine years ago on focus on the family. There are there are a lot more programs these days that are about uh, Christians being persecuted abroad and the need for Christians in the United States and to some extent Canada and the UK to take action to um, combat the persecution of Christians by either Latter-day communist regimes or uh, other dictators.
across the world. There isn't really any nuance that I've seen either with James Dobson or Warren uh, understanding about Islam. Certainly no sense that, that Muslims ought to be more true to their own tradition. Uh, well, I suppose the Muslim countries are places where Christians are persecuted. Among those other are the ones that are pinpointed. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then this is the way Saddam Hussein is talked about. Here. When, they, when they talk about justifying the war, they talk about the inability of Christian evangelists to penetrate Iraq. And when, the sold, when, when Warren discusses the soldiers on the battlefield, what they're doing often is not just fighting, but converting people. And then it becomes, but it, it does revert back to the narcissism that we were talking about before, because it becomes about how many soldiers within the U.S. Armed Forces have become born-again Christians as a result of being in the Army. I wonder how, you know, the internationalist thing, you remember that uh, not so many months ago where all these uh, evangelical Koreans were taken hostage in Afghanistan? You know, there was this whole thing. And one of the things that made clear is the, this enormous, the enormous proportion of people, of Christian evangelicals in, in kind of missionizing activities abroad who are not American, I mean, who are Korean in, in particular, but also from, there's a kind of big racial shift there. And I don't know if there's any reflection upon Christianity as a global community in which it's the people outside America are not simply there to be missionized, are not simply there yeah. to be served, but why are you doing it? Only, only in the sense that, um, only in the sense that, uh, as far as Warren goes, one of the things that he did recently that's being talked about now with all the flap over with, did he reverse himself on gay rights or not, was he uh, sort of communicated to Anglican church leaders outside the West that if they ever wanted to come to the United States, they would have a home away from home at Saddleback Ministries in Orange County because he supported, you know, their conflict, them in the conflict with the North American Episcopalians over the ordination of gay and lesbian pastors. Maybe we should open it up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, it's been a fascinating discussion, but uh, we should maybe take questions from the floor. I'll let you guys just come on. Well, I've, I've been trying to think together these things, uh, which obviously are also extremely disparate. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I thought about them was uh, if I understood correctly, in both, although in very different ways, both are contemptuous of politics and of existing state structures. That is, both seem to regard themselves as part of a movement that can't easily be understood, not only can't be understood in state terms, but they wouldn't want it to be understood in state terms that they transcended politics. And both have recourse to a category of humanity, but in a funny way, it seems to be are blind to their own exclusive notion of humanity, which I think are very different from one another. Uh, you know, you have these evangelical missionaries, and I'm, I'm trying this out. I don't know whether what I'm saying is correct. Whereas, uh, it seems to me that the emphasis on sacrifice uh, says something about wanting to constitute a community. That is, you, it's an altruistic act that, in a sense, solidifies a community. Uh, and in that sense, they're diametrically opposed. That is, one is, as you emphasize, Paul, that your activities are going to lower your stress level, make you a happier individual. Uh, whereas here, um, with what you were talking about, Faisal, it seems to me the emphasis is much more on um, the idea of a community which leads me to infer that the idea is that there is a community under siege. And therefore, sacrifice is required in order to maintain it. And in a sense, there might be all of these gestures to humanity. But uh, basically, it's to consolidate 
the community. Do you know? yeah. is, that, is that fair? Uh, yes, you know, I, I do think, I mean, what I would say is that in the 1960s, so before this form of militancy arises, and among people you would properly call fundamentalists, who you know seem to be dedicated to a status project, the founding of an Islamic state, in places like Pakistan, what you have is this very curious language of um, uh, where they'll say, for instance, uh, that uh, our behavior must be regulated by the historical norms prevalent uh, among the Prophet and his companions in the 7th century. Um, and this is a familiar enough trope. But what's interesting about it and why it's justified is, is, is to say this is the only way in which we can remain, we can claim neutrality and universality. Um, we, we, we know, this is the only way in which we know, we, we prevent ourselves from falling into our interest politics, at least ostensibly, right? So, and, and very explicitly, these leaders will say, look, our greatest threat today are communists, trades unions, uh, liberals, etc., etc., right? And all these people want to do is to confine us and say, you are this, you are petty bourgeois, you are that. And by, by completely modeling ourselves on the seventh century in a kind of sacrificial way, but it's not yet become a martyrological what we do is we abstract ourselves from the language of everyday politics and say that precisely because we sacrifice the politics of interest, uh, we don't claim to be constituted along those lines, we can represent the Muslim community and perhaps the human race. So in a way it's a kind of negative form of representation, negative insofar as they are fighting against those who claim to represent particular classes, uh, national groups, etc., etc., who are their opponents. Uh, it's only more recently that you have this one really significant move of uh, when you abandon the language of the Islamic State, more or less, and say the sacrifice is now not simply living in a certain way that shows that we are not part of an interest politics, but in actually, um, in, in actually becoming martyrs um, in, in um, doing away with ourselves altogether, uh, the ultimate sacrifice, and this shows that we are um, that we have in our possession universality and therefore we represent in this non-political way um, a community and through it the human race. Uh, so that is to say that in, in the 60s it's very, very explicit. So that is to say, in the, in the 60s, it's very, very explicit who they are fighting against, the politics of class uh, and the politics of nation, uh, both of which are based on forms of representation that are more institutionalized. Um, uh, and these guys reject that kind of... And now, the militants now use the global arena as the kind of um, justification or reason uh, for their forms of sacrifice. So it's almost like they say, Look, these forms of representation, such as elections, are only possible within states, um, within certain polities. But they leave out the Muslim community as a global entity, which exists. Or they leave out the human race. Elections are not going to represent the human race. So apart from all the other criticisms that may be leveled against democratic uh, politics, um, the one that they seem to find uh, most likable is that they, they cannot take this arena into consideration, uh, and therefore, uh, a politics of representation is only is parochial, uh, and it, it might have its place, but that's a very narrow place. But what we're doing is trying to figure out what representation means, but outside institutions of representation, in in some other supposed global space. Uh, so it's a it's a really interesting kind of dialectic, uh, but it's anti-political, as you say, and it does create a community in this way. And I think that, you know, the, um, although you're right, the, the aspect of martyrdom is certainly not there in this new evangelicalism. What is there is sacrifice of the other 
to reconstitute the national community. Because what, what happens is that since this global network is not yet fully realized, the United States has to step in and open up possibilities for evangelists worldwide to go about continuing to build the network. And so that becomes the rationale then for their, re, you know, uh, you have to bring nation back into um, this global community. So humanity doesn't actually exist yet. It's sort of put off um, into the future. And in the meantime, the wars must be fought. And the national community must assert itself. And then, so, yeah, I think that's where, that's where the justification of, of war comes from in this. And it's, 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 it, it's a way that I think in this evangelicalism, there is a similar kind of invocation of humanity as a unitary agent in the negative. Because the US soldiers and evangelists, or US evangelists cum soldiers, are supposedly acting for the sake of humanity as a whole. Um, but they can only do that by, it's like the surgeon, you know, sacrificing the cancer, which is Islamic terrorism uh, as an Islamic state. They're not distinguished. Um, you know, which, which threatens the realization of this global community. I have a question. Um, I'd like to hear some comparative thoughts about the politics of affect in these two situations. Um, Paul, you were pretty clear about the kind of mobilization of some kind of, uh, you know, trans-local politics of feeling in, in the kind of ministry that you're talking about. But Faisal, it strikes me that one of the things going on here, precisely in the attempt to find a kind of politics uh, of representation beyond conventional institutions of representation, has to do with the circulation of affect in terms of images. Um, you know, the way in which, say, videotapes and the internet have been deployed by Islamic uh, or Islamist militants um, to constitute uh, a, a, a community of feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and one that can lay some kind of claim to being a kind of transcendently depersonalized community of feeling in a way that perhaps ironically both echoes and displaces the kind of thing that Paul is talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as I as said earlier, um, one of the things that's different is that there is, um, well, the language of pity is invoked a great deal. And images that are familiar enough from um, uh, from the, the rhetoric of humanitarianism, from the displays of humanitarianism that we all know, uh, are also deployed. Uh, there is there is no kind of one-to-one -one identification made. What I do find interesting, as far as an economy of affect is concerned, is that this Muslim well, first of all, the Muslim community that is constantly invoked does not exist. Right, as a global, it has no institutional or other presence, and that's precisely what is constantly being brought up. Right, that it exists, but it doesn't exist. Uh, it's our sacrifice that will make it exist. But in order for that to happen, they have to have a, almost a kind of posthumous vision of themselves, um, whether or not they are martyrs or sacrificing. So the Muslim community, and even in the 19th century, so before all of this stuff, and I, of course I'm not suggesting there's a straight line from Sayyid Ahmad Khan you know, to Osama bin Laden, right? But, but when you look at you know, this text that I was describing on the, the and this is just the first of many uh, future texts on the decline of Islam, right? It really, uh, previous models of decline had been, you know, there had been apocalyptic ones, for instance, right? The coming of the Messiah, the end of the world, you know, or the, the rise and fall of dynasties. This is not like this. This is a kind of sociological picture, right? But also, it's, it sees Islam as something that's already dead. It's a posthumous vision of a community. Of a, as a global fact. It's very, very interesting. I think that's what's... Um, so even before, quite apart from images of dead bodies and you know, one's own death and all the rest, the Islam that is the Muslim community that is being envisioned is envisioned as already dead. Uh, it needs to be somehow called back into life. Or uh, even, even in the kind of poetry, and it's especially in poetry, you know, the par excellence, the kind of medium of affect in that sense, that um, uh, the sort of stirring invocations, there are no stirring invocations. It's like, it's gone, it's finished, you're dead. So Muhammad Iqbal pictures 
these poems that I was going to talk about was this great dialogue between a believer and God, right? And the believer says, you have abandoned us, you have shown favor to our rivals, right? to our enemies, um, and we are nothing. God is pictured as a woman, as a, as a, as a beloved, as a traditional beloved of poetry, right? And, and the infidel is seen as a rival, a, a rival in love. And then God answers in the next poem and says, I haven't abandoned you, you have abandoned me. So again, the language of love is, is multiplied. But, but what's interesting is that this whole kind of language, Islam is already dead, right? So the, the descriptions are of idols laughing because Islam has gone, of Muslims leaving the stage of the world with their Qurans tucked under their arms, kind of striding off, right? It's finished. And that, I think, is what is, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a peculiarly uh, melancholic, um, language and that's where the, the, the sort of emotion lies I think and so looking back upon one's own demise there's nothing of the elegiac There's nothing of the elegiac um, or the mournful about, you know, the new evangelicals. It's just resolutely triumphalist. Uh, and uh, insofar as they talk about death, and he does talk about death quite a bit when he refers to these disasters, but death becomes a point of this empathy that magically, you know, eliminates the, the space between one culture and another or one race and another. Uh, and... Um, you know, and, and then it's always about the decision to convert or not to convert and thus avoid eternal death. So, yeah, it's, you know, the, aff the affective organization here is, you know, very much more about a victory that is certain and you know, I mean, sports more than <laughs> it's, it is. It's, it's sort of cheering for the right team is what it's important. It's interesting to think of how, um, you know, this language of sacrifice and theft that I've been thinking about can be deployed completely differently. So if you take, say, return to someone like Gandhi, right? So it's quite familiar, it's not only among these Indian Muslims that this language, you know, the, the, the West has come and they are better than us, they've conquered us, why is it they've stolen from us? We need to recover ourselves. It's a familiar logic. What does Gandhi say in a text like in Suraj is first, you know, so he's, it's, a, it's constructed as a dialogue between a terrorist, very instructively for my purposes, and you know, um, Gandhi, say, the figure of Gandhi, right? And so the terrorist figure says, well, you know, these guys have come and they've, it's like a thief breaking into your house, right? To steal your own stuff. And of course we need to fight back. And Gandhi's response is, what if the thief was your father? Right, it's great. Um, and you know, you can imagine the terrorist, I mean, what, what are you talking about? And of course in deploying the trope of the father, there are many ways in which you can read it, but one very simple way is, uh, for example, the British were seen, were described and described themselves as the father and mother, right, of um, the, the, the language of paternity was very common in British India, especially in popular Indian languages, my Ba, right? Um, and so Gandhi said, well, what if the thief was your father? Wouldn't you rather uh, sort of pretend to be asleep in your house and let him steal who you are? Um, and so he completely turns around this logic, this language, uh, and sort of ties it up in a kind of knot and then he can bring forward his whole thing of non-violence and, and, and all the rest. And there too, conversion is important because non-violence is meant to convert the other. Um, and so that there, there are ways even in this period of completely twisting this language, but it doesn't happen in the, you know, uh, in, the in the writings um, and thinking of these people who are describing. I want to pick up on, on one aspect that, um, but I'm not sure if I missed it. But, um, see, the more each of you are talking, and of course I'm, I'm really not that familiar with the material, so 
trying to feel my way with it. Uh, the more cheap to me, humanity is almost like a stage for a struggle, rather than actually identifying itself as with humanity, but rather humanity should be like us. Um, the, uh, the, when I said earlier that it seemed both of you talked about this as being contemptuous of politics, uh, on a state level, but not so much on an imperial level, that uh, when you were talking about the attitude towards Iraq, mm -hmm. Amer the American military becomes the vehicle for the universalization of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here you have, in a sense, the consolidation of the Ummah as necessary against that. Um, and so there's reference to humanity. But basically, the more I'm listening to you, the more it seems to me that humanity is the stake and the stage rather than it being in any more conventional sense a kind of a universalist uh, humanist vision on, on either side. Is that, is that fair? It's especially when you consider that you know, ultimately there's going to be this final drama where it's important for the reality of salvation through Christ that not everyone accepts Jesus so that there can be this global struggle this cosmic struggle between the forces of good and evil, talking about the, the apocalyptic uh, beliefs there, that, um, yeah, no, ultimately this is a humanity that is never supposed to completely uh, come to fulfillment as a unitary agent. Uh, you do what you do for the sake of humanity, knowing that God's heart will be broken, and that our hearts will be broken. Maybe there's an element of the elegiac there. Um, Our hearts will be broken in what? Because some will just stubbornly uh, resist conversion and, and you know, cling to their evil ways. I mean, I think the, you're right, it's not a humanistic vision at all for these people. Um, and when they invoke humanity, um, at least in the late 19th century, from the late 19th and the early 20th century, Often the category humanity is set deliberately against, as I suggested, the sort of imperial categories of race and civilization. Right? As being, this is what the Europeans have lost uh, when they rejected Jesus, right? the universal ethics of Jesus. Um, and they've ended up with uh, competing and rival nationalisms, color bar, and all of these things. Right? So we, on the other hand, um, are, while not being Christians, might be better Christians than they are. Uh, just like they are better Muslims than we are in, in some other remove. Um, uh, so we invoke humanity. Uh, and once you do that, but then it puts all of these people, these religious and other groups together in a kind of intimacy which allows for competition. And then of course the race is all about you know, who's going to represent it best. But you're right, I mean this humanity, it's not, even though it's often spoken of as a potential subject, um, it does provide a, a kind of um, the arena on the stage, as you suggest, for, or in this sense, of, of, for competition and rivalry, but of a very intimate sort, because what's been taken out is the language of race and civilization, for instance. All right. Even though, of course, those are also deployed as weapons. You believe in race and civilization. How horrible. You haven't. You have lost the universal, which Jesus gave you as a free gift. <laughs> and Iqbal says things like that all the time. Uh, you know, and, but even before Iqbal, someone like Amir Ali, so it, it comes from, a, you know, again, Amir Ali is someone who's a, a, a kind of, a, what today would be called a moderate, you know, a, a, the first Indian to be privy councillor in London, etc. So very, you know, high-ranking figure, knighted, and all the rest, and, um, uh, but who begins this polemical tradition by making use of, um, begins it in a significant way, by making use of Christian, not only sources, which had been done, of course, from medieval times, uh, but sort of throwing it back uh, in this, uh, in a way that was not simply citing the Bible to show that Muhammad's coming was foretold in there, uh, but by saying, um, can you call yourself a Christian? You know, we, are, like, we might be better Christians than you, while rejecting the name, while rejecting what it means to be Christian. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a degree of intimacy that permits of rivalry uh, without the language of race and civilization.
it strikes me that although, you know, you, I think you're right that ultimately, in neither case are we talking about uh, universalism, human universalism, there is another affinity which, which would have to do with abstract equality. When you talk about, and we didn't want to talk about this in the discussion, but in the paper, this discussion about metaphysical guilt and the way that any survivor is de facto guilty because others have died and suffered. Um, that is somehow, it reminds me a little bit of the logic that, you know, warrants people make that anyone can participate in this economy of emotional exchange. Uh, and, you know, your emotions are really fungible completely with someone in Afghanistan or in Nigeria because they're, they're the same. And, um, and, and the way that that mimics the rationality of the market, too. So, there is that form of universalism, yeah. the capitalistic universalism that's part of that. Yeah, which creates a, a different kind of intimacy altogether. which creates a, a different kind of intimacy altogether, which, is, which doesn't have to be based on these kinds of notions of humanity as a potential subject or anything of the sort. Um, yeah, or, or is simultaneously creating intimacy and alienation at the same time. They are distancing from mm -hmm. the other. To move, uh, this will be a uh, uh, last question. Sorry, I, well, it's not particularly well worked out question. Um, that one that's perhaps uh, directed at Faisal as well, uh, more. Um, I missed the first part of your talk, but I was struck by uh, this conversation of how the language of affect itself may be growing out of um, or responding to a, a critique of the sphere of circulation and to move the conversation toward a critique, a critique of political economy, perhaps. The, the, all the thinkers that you talked about in the Indian context strike me as um, there's a very similar kind of process that comes after the crisis of liberalism in 1848 and 57, right, that Hindu thinkers are thinking through. And there's a question of trying to find a universal form of Hinduism that unites the, the that can find a way of adequately aligning the categories of capital and labor under a kind of organic conception of a universal Hindu nation. Um, and I was wondering to what degree after, I mean, there's a sort of transition that you make from the 19th century to the 20th, and whether that language or critique of political economy and the idea of having to respond to the sort of global imperatives of an imperial economy fall out, of, or to what degree they remain in the discourse of Al-Qaeda. Um, if, I, if I understood you, they, um, starting with Al-Qaeda, sort of, there is a lot, there are a bunch of cliches that are deployed, right? Uh, some of which you might not have been here when I, when I sort of quoted from Zawahiri. So he, he goes on about, um, you know, environmental degradation, climate change, this, that, uh, humanitarian relief. You know, all these things operate as a series of cliches that everyone has heard and knows. Um, and that are familiar in NGO language around the world. Um, and they operate as a kind of shorthand, so you can read whatever you want. Um, you can have, you can construct a Chomskyan kind of argument out of them, you can construct some other kind. Um, they're not ever filled out in any way. Um, so that they, there's constant reference to them, uh, but only as a shorthand, uh, which allows for, um, you know, which allows for, as, as for a kind of leftist reading of you know, of jihadism insofar as it's a, it's a form of critique. Uh, but nothing really, uh, no other categories really touched upon. The poor, yes, class, yes, race in America especially, yes, all of these things. But all is journalistic cliches. Uh, and so what, what happens is that there is a kind of um, invitation to read what 
to read your own framework, your through your own theory in it. Because what's provided are the, a set of materials, but they can go in more than one direction. Just as in some senses here, you know, race. Um, so it, various things are acknowledged and the kind of like buttons that you can push. Um, as far as the, um, uh, you know, this 19th century, in terms of Hindu thinkers, I mean, what I find very interesting is, I guess someone like Andrew Sartori's new book, which really tackles the subject in a, with a seriousness which it, it has not received before, is, um, you know, well, we'll probably have to start from there uh, and think about, you know, in his terms, you know, Hinduism as culture, that one chapter in his book was a great chapter, but also as the, the culture form and all that. And that provides us, I think, with a very important uh, beginning point to, to take, to take uh, an argument. What interests me in these figures is how they, um, in these Indian Muslim figures of the 19th and 20th century, is how they, and this has never been looked at to my knowledge, how they also play themselves off against Hinduism. But not in a necessarily in a kind of negative sense, right? Um, so there's a, there's a kind of competitive element just as there is with Christianity in the West. Right? Um, and it can go just as with Christianity in either way. I mean, what comes to mind is this um, a very important uh, figure, a poet, um, who was also, I think, a magistrate, uh, Akbar Ilahabadi, um, who in 1919 wrote this uh, really amazing text called the Gandhi Nama going back to Gandhi, right? So the epic of Gandhi, it's a kind of mock heroic thing. And he says in there, um, you know, what I said earlier, you know, that, that, you know, Gandhi and reforms, but people like Abul Khalam Azad, um, an associate of Gandhi, also does this. People like Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan uh, in the Northwest Frontier Province also, you know, have this where, you know, explicitly Hindu terms or forms are seen as being Muslim ones. Um, in the case of, uh, of um, so they think through Hinduism in a way, which is very, very interesting. So they'll, they'll say, uh, someone like Akbar El Habadi says, for instance, that um, he has a kind of a funny, semi-funny dialogue right, between himself and a bottle of water that's been brought from Mecca, right? The holy water of Zamzam, right? And the bottle of water um, has decided to pour itself out. He says, what, what possessed you to pour yourself out in this way? And the bottle of water replies that for too long have I been confined in the bottle. Now I can run free with the Ganges. It's been poured, it's poured itself into the Ganges. But now no, you know, it's funny and it's great and all the rest, but it's at the same time it's a kind of comparison which says, you know, is it a question of Islam uh, losing itself in the Ganges? There's this whole kind of, uh, you, you walk back to a whole other kind of trope of um, Hinduism as a kind of all-devouring form, right, which get appropriate anything and everything. In this case, that same very negative image is seen very positively as I run free with the Ganges. The holy water of Mecca has poured itself into the holy river um, of the Hindus and therefore finds itself in the Ganges. But this is by no means a, a kind of, um, uh, uh, this, this kind of statement, poetic statement, I don't think is linked in any serious way with a kind of pre-modern aesthetic of you know whether it's syncretistic, it's not like that. It's not about the poets of the Sufi poets, the Bhakti poets who come who talk about you know the intermingling of religion. It's a very different sort of thing because it presupposes an other move of um, uh, the, the fear of absorption, um, and that other move presupposes two communities demographically conceived. Um, all right, so everything has changed. The world has changed. It's no longer uh, a mystical. Thing. It's not a mystical poem at all, uh, but it simply means that freedom of a certain sort, uh, and even in the sense of political economy, can now be thought of, and perhaps can only be thought of, in these kinds of ways, through someone like Gandhi, through you know, Hindu metaphors, through Christianity, through um, in which Islam discovers, rediscovers itself. And that's where the Sartori project can link up with this other stuff. It's not simply um, you know, being called Hindus. Uh, On that note, I think uh, we should thank both of our speakers uh, for for undertaking what was really a, a, a very challenging dialogue. I feel like we're just getting started, and, and here we are at the end. Uh, but if if everyone could join me in thanking them.
Uh, thanks so much.